Hi there, my name is Jack McKenzie and I am a Scottish composer, orchestrator and arranger and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Now for some composers and music creators out there, the task of taking their track used and sequenced in a DAW using MIDI and transforming it into a readable piece of music using notation software is often seen as quite a daunting task. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a very brief and basic tutorial of how to do exactly that using Logic Pro and Doracle Pro. Let's dive in. So the track that I'm going to be using to demonstrate this process is my arrangement and transcription of the cue Truth from Game of Thrones Season 7 by Raman Jawadi. Originally this cue was a demonstration of the capabilities of how CSS would react or cinematic studio strings and I thought that this would be a really good example to use because it only just deals with strings and doesn't have all those other elements of orchestral instruments to overcomplicate this process for new beginners. The MIDI and project file of the track that I'm going to be using today is actually in the description of this video on my channel linked above and below so please check that out and you can follow along with me as we go. This process can be quite arduous but hopefully I'll be able to take you from A to B of how to get all of your MIDI out of your project and into a notation software. Today I'm going to be using Logic Pro and Doracle 3.5 to do mine. So let's just dive in. The first thing we're going to do is we have all these MIDI regions and we have all of them as instrument tracks. Now they all have some sort of processing on them too. The first thing that I would do as if I was preparing my project for an orchestrator, you have to remember that your orchestrator may not have one, the DAW that you're using, nor have any of the sample libraries that you use. So they should still be able to hear the instruments that you want them to orchestrate. So the first thing that I would do is I'm going to set a cycle in Logic and I'm going to highlight all of my tracks. And then I'm going to hit Control, Command and B. Now what this is going to do is it's going to render the tracks in place. And when we do this, we're presented with this little dialog box that comes up and I want to make sure that I uncheck the bypass effect plugins. This means that the effect plugins that you've got on those tracks will render in place with the audio file. And this means that any of your processing that you've done to any of these instrument tracks will be baked into the audio that you render, meaning that your orchestrator is going to hear exactly what you've been hearing as you mock up. So if we click OK, it should render the files. Now it might take a little time. It shouldn't take too long because it's not an awfully long track. Okay, so once the render has completed, you have, in Logic Pro at least, a render of the tracks underneath each of the MIDI tracks. Now I've set up a key command to select all of my MIDI tracks and all of my audio tracks, and I use Control shift a for all of my MIDI and Control shift q for all of my audio tracks. And it means that I'm not just going through and highlighting each individual one, I'm selecting all the tracks that I need to and it speeds up my workflow when we do this a lot of the time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Control, Shift and A to select all of my MIDI tracks. In Logic, I'm going to hold Option and click on the on off switch. Now what this does is it unloads your instrument, not just turn off the track, but unloads the instrument from your RAM. And one of the main reasons why I do this is if I was to send this to another person who doesn't have those contact libraries, the first thing that they're gonna do or they're gonna see when they load up this project is contact can find this library, contact can find this library. And if you've done that before, you will know how laborious it is to sit and click abort, abort, or ignore this time. And it just means that you're wasting that time and energy that you could be doing work. It's also costing you money for this time to happen. So by doing this step, you're reducing the amount of money that you're going to be paying your orchestrator because they're not clicking on that ignore button over and over again. What I also like to do as well is if I click Control, Shift, and Q to highlight all of my audio tracks, I'm going to click H, to open the hide menu, I'm going to click H on one of the tracks. All of the selected tracks will then highlight the H and I'm going to click H again. Now this is just hidden those tracks. They're still there and they can still be played if I play a little bit here. 
So now the orchestrator can hear, but doesn't have to wade through all of those audio files. Now the first thing that we wanna do is we want to make sure that all of these regions, not all the tracks, but all of the individual regions are unmuted. This little dot on the left-hand side of a MIDI region in Logic means that the region itself is muted. So what we wanna do is unmute that by clicking Control and M. And so what this means is that when we go to select all of the tracks to export, it's not exporting muted regions, which means that all of our MIDI data will be exported into the file and we're not going to miss anything at all. So this next step, depending on schedule and tight deadlines, the composer sometimes doesn't do, the assistant might do it, or they might require the orchestrator to do it. If I'm sending this to someone, I will make sure that I go through all of my MIDI and tidy it up, even if this takes a little bit more time. It means that I know that what they are receiving is correct in my mind, and I'm not leaving anything to chance for the orchestrator to mess up with because my MIDI isn't quantized in the right way. Just by taking that extra few minutes means that I'm not wasting money or time on a mistake that might actually cost quite a bit during a session. So I'm just gonna go through and I'm going to start quantizing. Now in Logic, there is a great function where you can, I'm just remembering what, how the rhythm goes. Now, great example. If you can't remember what it goes, I could just click play and I could, So I know that it's in eighth note. So if I go over here and I set my quantization to an eighth note, they should all snap to place. And there's a really great feature in Logic and it's called Force Legato. And you can access this by if you highlight all the notes that you want and if you click shift and backslash, what this does is it will join the current selected notes all the way to the next available note. And that means that you know that you're not trying to stretch each note to the individual notes. So one, you're saving time. And two, it means that it's going to be quantized correctly. So we can see if we look at the grid, each of these notes are now joined up to the next available note. So I'm just gonna go quickly through again. And know where I want to so actually all of these notes can be quantized by an eighth note because that's the minimum division that we have in this track. Now sometimes what happens is that depending on the legato engine, especially with CSS, you have to play quite ahead of the beat. And when you quantize these things, sometimes, especially to an eighth note, it will lock onto the eighth note before and not the eighth note of downbeat, for instance, just here. That's what's happened here. So what you wanna go is just double check that they're all matching up to where they should be. For, for instance, this beat should definitely be here. That should be here. And again, we can have a listen. We know that. So essentially all of these have just jumped very slightly. So what we can do is we can just highlight them all together and move them over. And I know that when it comes up here, and especially you can see the automation data, this is the, the huge climax. So we do want actually to have a small gap here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to see the handle here and snap it to the grid. And that means that any notes before that, I can highlight again shift and backslash, and it's going to force the gas of them. So now if I quickly look back, I can see that it's all in the right place. So I can instantly see from the pattern before that this note and this note have moved. And again, with this note and all the subsequent notes have moved by one eighth. So that we're just gonna move them over again. And again, we can now highlight, shift, backslash, and all the notes have joined again to one another. Now the only one that you want to really watch out for is the end because if I highlighted and clicked shift and backslash, what will that do is we'll move it to the end of the region because it has no note to join up to. It will just go to the end of the region. So if say you had your region as the end of the track, it will 
go to the end of the track. Now that's not what we want. So we want to make sure that the note is to the end of where we actually want the track. So we just take a listen to the rest of the track. One, two, off. So we definitely want it to the end of beat two. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually gonna speed this process up slightly just so that you guys aren't watching this over and over again. Okay, so I've gone through and I have quantized everything as it should be. So one way that we can just double check is if we highlight all of the regions, press P for piano. And if we quickly have a look, they should all be talking to the grid. Now, I know that at the start, some of them are coming in on the eighth note, so that's fine. However, I've just seen this here that looks slightly off which is not good. So I'm just gonna have a quick look and see where, if I can find them. I'm thinking it's, uh, there it is. So you can see instantly that they are slightly off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make sure that they are quantized. And I'm gonna hit shift and backslash to force legato and cut this off just here. So again, now if I click the regions, press piano. Again, we can maybe see this one, one little one here. Maybe that's something, let's have a look. Let's just go ahead anyway, and if we do have any issues, it means that I can show you what to do if you ever encounter any. So the best thing to do in Logic is to, or in any DAW actually, is to set your cycle from bar one, even though I'm assuming that MIDI will always export from bar one, it just means that you have bar one definitely there when you need to. Select all of the MIDI that you'd like to export, which is all these tracks. You can go up to File, Export, Selection as MIDI File. And we're just going to do this as truth, save, and that is the Logic Pro part. Now, do not close the door. Make sure that it keeps open. It just means that it's an extra reference point for if you need it when you are putting it into your notation software. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to close this down. And then I what I've done is I have created a standard strings template, and I will link this in the description below as well. This is just your five line stave strings. Now what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to create additional layers or additional instruments because this is a large string ensemble, but we'll get to that in a minute. What I'm first going to do is I'm going to find my MIDI file, which will be in my music. If I go to truthcss.mid, that's the one that I want. So I want to right click, open with, Doracle 3.5. Everything should be okay here. Just make sure that you preserve the note positions, definitely. Quantize options, I always kind of do it to the semi-quaver or the 16th note. Press okay. Make sure that split at MIDI note number is 60. Press okay. And as you can see, the MIDI file has encased everything in it, including your markers, which can be extremely useful when you're referencing scores for very, very long tracks or, or cues, so sometimes that's really good. But in this case, I've written a lot of theory behind it and we don't necessarily need that. This is not the score. This will be where we take the notes from and put it into our actual score. But as you can see, all of the notes have come through, even the time signatures. And at the moment, everything is looking all right, so there's not any huge mishaps. So here I can see a mishap already that's come through. You can see that this should be a unison rhythm. Do, 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 do. That should land here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna untie that and we're going to delete that note. And we're going to extend this here. And the same here, actually, we can just actually extend the note by here. So it does actually happen here again and here. So what we're gonna do is highlight them and we're gonna extend them so that they're minims. And again, here. That should be fine. If I spot any glaring errors, they usually come quite quickly.
So we notice that the rhythm here should be in unison, but the harmony isn't in unison. So what we can do is we can find the one that is in unison, and we can just copy, and we can pop that out here. And again, just make sure that all of these notes are kind of tied where they should be. That looks wrong. There we go. Again, we can always kind of check it when we go back to the Logic project as well. These are just references, but they should have come through pretty much all the way through. I can't see any major issues. So what I'm essentially going to do is I am going to follow my logic session. So if we go back into the logic session, we can see that we've got a cello soloist times two. So I've got Tina Guo um, taking on the top line of the cellos and Tina Guo taking on the basses because she has that really rich sound as a the solo cello. Fantastic sample from Cine Samples if you're, at, you're looking for a great solo cello. I've got three independent violin lines, A, B, and C. Violin two, I've got A and B. Violas, I've got A and B. Celli, I've got A, B, and C. I've also got a cello doubling the double bass, and I've got two double basses, but actually the double basses could probably go into Divisi. Yes, they do, so actually that's not too bad. So what I'm going to do is, although you can't see my second screen, I'm gonna keep this as a reference over on my second screen, and I'm gonna go into my Doracle project that I have, which is my standard strings template. I'm going to go back into setup and I'm going to add section players. So I need at least another violin and another violin. One, two, three, four, five. I need five violins. I've currently got four. Five violins. So we can just do violin one A. Violin 1B, 1C, Violin 2A, and Violin 2B. We also need another viola. And notice that in Dorico here, I'm not touching the single player, but I'm touching the section player. This is really good if you want to add any divisi in later on, but at the moment we don't want to add Divisi, we want to have these individual parts all the way through, or independent parts, I should say, all the way through. So definitely want another cello, and another cello, because Raman Jawadi loves his cellos. Cello two and cello three, and just to keep it clarified, we're gonna call it B, and cello C, and we're going to do cello A here, and double bass is actually fine. Okay, so now if we go into it, we have violin 1, violin 1B, one violin 1C, one violin 2, violin 2B, two, viola A, viola B, cello A, cello B, cello C, and double bass. So what I'm actually going to do is, again, you can't really see the other screen, I apologize. I'm gonna bring up my other Dorico, and the first thing that I'm going to do is what I always do, is take one line, so let's just take the violin legato. So I'm gonna take the first bar all the way to the last bar. And what I'm going to do is in Dorico, it highlights these tempo changes as blue. So what I wanna do is I wanna go through each individual tempo change and clicking on the time signatures as I go. Essentially what's happening is I am copying all of the other MIDI data that I need, as well as this first line of music. Just unhighlight the uh, marker there, the 6-4 that I missed, 4-4, four, four. and again, tempo changes, and I missed the two tempo changes there, 49 and 62, we've got everything, yep. There's a lot of tempo changes in this. There we 
go five, four, 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 five, four, 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 five, four. Three, four. I'm actually not entirely sure if these all time signatures are correct to the original, but it's what I heard and what I was able to transcribe. So please forgive me if I've butchered it, Ramin, if you are watching this. So what we're gonna do is we're going to hit Command and C, and we're gonna to go to our violin one, and we're gonna get Command and V. So what that has done is not only has it pasted the violin top legato line, but it's also now pasted in all of the tempo changes and the time signature changes that we need as well. And really, so you actually get the gist. This is the process that we do. I would go through all of it, but it's so pretty self-explanatory. What we do is we, we take the instruments that correspond from this general MIDI project and put it into the clean project. Always work from two different projects if you can. Don't try and clean up the project that you have. It means that you can always reference that project if something goes wrong or if there's anything amiss or anything like that at all. Always make sure that you've also got your DAW open up at the same time. It means that you can you can have another reference point just in case that goes awry sometimes as well. As you can see there, some issues do come up and you know I've done this many multiple times, but I didn't prepare the project properly with naming. I came in straight into it from where I'd left it off. So it was just to give you guys what would happen if things like this happen, if I was to send it to an orchestrator, some issues might come up like this. So hopefully that has given you an insight into the kind of process that we we do, but also how you can prepare your MIDI in your DAW better for your orchestrator and how you export your MIDI from your DAW and into your notation software. If you would like to see a separate video on how to tidy up MIDI once it's into the notation software and maybe a Dorico walkthrough, I'm more than happy to do that. Just let me know down in the comments and I'll make sure that I can get that one up for you guys as well. Hopefully now a lot of you don't feel as apprehensive as you might have been trying to take your music out of your DAW that you have spent hours, days, if not weeks on and putting it into notation. There's always something about taking your music from an electronic format and putting it onto a score that just as a, as a musician, as a composer, as a player, it just gives you a little bit of pride when it comes to a piece of music that you've written. It's now in readable format that if you had the, the time, the budget or the opportunity to record live, it's there and ready to go. If you did find this video helpful at all, please hit that like button and subscribe for more. I've been Jack McKenzie and see you on the next one.